Welcome to the Charleston premieres. Thank you for coming. We have a great lineup of uh, companies presenting their newest and most innovative products and services for you this year. Uh, and for the first time ever, we're going to be doing Audience Choice Awards. So at the end of the session, it's going to be like American Idol. You're going to text your votes into the system. And uh, of course, there are no losers. Everyone's a winner just for being in the premieres. It is a competitive uh, process to get in. So uh, you have the best of the best already. Um, so you want to have your cell phones ready for the end of the session, but please remember to keep them on silent. Um, and <laughs> our first uh, presentation is Johan from Lean Library. Thanks very much. Here we go. So um, until last year, I worked at the innovations department at uh, Utrecht University Library in the Netherlands. And uh, innovation, of course, is all about um, uh, improving your services for your end users. Uh, so I had lots of one-on-one -on -one conversations with uh, patrons of the library about their use of the library. And we had a really nice method of getting uh, these uh, conversations started. With a colleague, uh, I would go to the coffee bar, nine o'clock in the morning, and there'd be a line of people waiting to get a cup of coffee. And we'd walk up to somebody and say, well, what if we pay for your cup of coffee? And you'll have a short conversation with us about your use of the library. Um, well, at first, this felt kind of, kind of, um, uh, kind of difficult, difficult uh, but that was only at first, because this turned out to be a really nice way to get uh, amazing conversations with patrons, um, with a di really diverse set of them. University Library in the Netherlands. Um, and from all, those, uh, from all those, those conversations, two of them actually stuck with me. And one was with a girl that uh, when I asked her, uh, she told me that to, to get access to digital resources, she would just hop on a bike, uh, ride it to the library, and no matter the weather, that's how she would get access to those digital resources. Very healthy, of course. Um, and if she couldn't make it, she would text somebody whom she would know to be in the library. Um, she simply didn't know that it was possible to get access from off-campus from her apartment uh, uh, in the city center. And the other conversation that stuck with me was with a girl that, that used to read the New York Times uh, all the time, but she hadn't found out about the license that the library had for the New York Times until after two years of studying. She simply didn't know. Um, you might have heard similar stories from, from your own patents when you have uh, cups of coffee with them. And what I learned, what I realized is uh, libraries can actually be quite difficult to use. Some systems require considerable effort from, from patrons. And those patrons, they come to the university to study uh, mathematics, maybe literature, economics, but they need to study the library as well. So what are we to do? And then I had an idea. What, what if we build a browser extension? What if we make it proactive? What if we make it automatic? Um, so, so you don't need to know whether your li library has a license for a specific resource, as the browser extension will just uh, automatically tell you. Uh, and it will present you with an easy proxy link so you don't have to dig it up on the library website yourself. Um, and you don't need to figure out whether you're on the right IP address uh, to get access. And what if we also focus on security and privacy, make it real secure, no usernames, passwords, don't store anything of that at all. so that Patrons are actually willing to, uh, to use it. And this was all, all a hunch. So what we did is we built a first prototype and uh, started experimenting, see whether it would catch on with end users. More cups of coffee, more discussions, um, iterations across uh, different, different versions. Until at a certain point in time, um, most of the reactions were among these lines. And right now, it's in use at Utrecht University Library. More than 5,000 people are using it uh, just because it saves them time and just because it makes using the library a little bit easier and they can concentrate on the subjects that they want to study. Uh, and this made me realize that there's a world to win in, in making libraries a little bit more easy to use, a little bit more convenient. Um, and there's patrons all over the world struggling with exactly these same issues. And that's why uh, 
last year I uh, partnered up with a web development agency and founded Lean Library and turned this first prototype into a pr professional uh, production version. Here's what it looks like on the, on the right side of the screen from Stanford. And Stanford, actually this morning, no joke, they agreed to sign up for using it. And Harvard signed up as well a few weeks ago. You might have seen them on Twitter uh, uh, tweeting about it. Um, if you'd be interested in using this for your own library, if you recognize these issues, and if you think it would be really nice to, to, to make your own library a little bit more easy to use for your patents, then please do, do get in touch with me. Um, you can either get up to me uh, after this, this session, uh, get in touch with me through Twitter or email, uh, and make it real easy. There's a bo box at the, the entrance of the room. Just drop your business card in there, and I will get in touch with you. Thanks very much. I forgot to mention, we're going to try to make time for questions uh, for all presenters at towards the end of the session, but before the voting. Uh, but we're going to see how the timing goes to see if we actually have time for questions. But if not, I encourage you to approach these fine folks after the, the presentation if you have questions. Uh, and next we have uh, Michelle from Casalini. Thank you all for being here. I'm very glad for the opportunity to talk about our latest developments to bring BIPFRAME into practice. As you probably know, we are based in Italy, supply library worldwide with European publications and host on our full text platform e-content for over 250 publishers, mostly in humanities and social sciences from Romance language countries. But the backbone of our organization has been, since the 50s, the cataloging division, where our team produces approximately 50,000 original book in hand, full RDA records with all the authority work as member of PCC, the program of cooperative cataloging. In 2015, the library community we serve told us that we should be in the short term future become ready to supply data, not only in MARC, but also applying BIPFRAME. This brought us to start investing in this field together with our long-standing technological partner at CALT, and we presented the first results at the Library of Congress BIPFRAME Forum in Boston at midwinter 2016. I don't have <coughs> time to, <coughs> to go um, to talk about theory now. But let me just mention that linked data allows the revolution of the paradigm shift from record to entity approach. The benefits for libraries is that the new data model is being expressed in RDF, Resource Description Framework, and therefore compliant with the World Wide Web Consortial specifications. The semantic web allows embracing not only the library, but also the archives and museum domains to reveal a richness within the data of existing collections, often hidden and or unexpressed in a traditional catalog, and all this without imposing changes in the local operational systems that continue to work with MARC. In summer 2016, following these first steps, a research and development project with 16 North American institutions was defined, and ShareVDE is currently ending its phase two that foresees the enrichment and conversion in linked data of approximately 100 million records of the participant libraries. This is an overview of the involved procedures. Among the major components, there are Outify for entity detection, URI enrichment and reconciliation, the database of relationship, the knowledge base of cluster, Lodify for the conversion into BIPFRAME2, applying also additional useful ontologies, and uh, a three-layered BIPFRAME platform for work person instance items that offer a significant new approach for the various categories of users. Concretely, what are we proposing to libraries in order to take advantage of this new environment for their newly acquired acquisitions and um, publications? Mark records supply with a preferred URI for the various entity types. BIPFRAME 2 dataset supply, publication of, on the three-layered BIPFRAME platform, and uh, Casalini Libris ISNI registration agent, agency involved activities. 
And this is what we are proposing for the library's entire catalogs. Data enrichment through entity identification processes, reconciliation and cluster creation with access to the cluster knowledge base in RDF, conversion into BibFrame 2 datasets, enhanced mark records with the preferred URIs, publication on the three-layer BibFrame platform, for example, sharevde.org, and uh, update management procedures. It is, of course, uh, a moving wall field. Therefore, the development continues, and on our side, we are always based them on the input we receive from your community. These are some examples of the use cases that are under discussion. Original RDF cataloging, further recordless management visualization approach, retroconversion for originally created RDF data into the local MARC operational systems, URI registry implementation. This was a very brief overview, and uh, thank you for your attention. I'm very happy to have to listen to your answers, feedback, and of course, collect uh, your interest. Thank you. So next we have Ravi from DIMCO. Hello everyone, good evening. We're, I'm here to talk about linked data and, um, and how it's a powerful tool for academic library outreach. Um, so I have a lot of slides. I'm going to go a little quick and maybe skip through some of them. So 21st century li academic libraries are fundamentally changing. They're trying to meet the, change, meet the needs of the students, maker spaces, digital creations, to, uh, digital labs, business incubators, work and study programs, connection, connecting students to industries. Libraries are fundamentally transforming and expanding their services. And then you have on the other side, people searching for resources, people searching for how-tos, educational information, small business startup resource information. So those are the two things that are happening in our industry. Right? So the question is how do you get this vast plethora of collections and events to show up where your students are already searching? The answer is linked data. I think it's pretty obvious. History, historical context, Tim Berners-Lee coined the term in 2006. There was a seminal TED talk in 2009 that deconstructed uh, linked data. Context, con contextualizing what it is is basically opening up of all your internal data to search engines. But you have more than just books, right? And up until now, the discoverability of predominantly most of these resources as it pertains to linked data has been in the, in, the, in the domain of books. So what is Discover Local? Discover Local is a brand new product that, uh, that, that is built upon our discovery platform, which connects the patrons, community, to the library. Uh, we have a whole slew of products, one uh, mobile, events, room management, site management, signage and learning, but I'm focusing on just the Discover Local part of the product today. So what does Discover Local do? Basically, it facilitates discoverability, allows your students and patrons around you to connect, and facilitate interaction. So how does search results without Discover Local look like today? When people are searching for yoga classes, what's evidently missing is your library, right? With, the search, with, with, with Discover Local, your library shows up. Not only does it show up, it shows up with the timing, uh, because it's phasic in nature, the start time, end time. It also brings up the room it's going to be in. And lastly, it's free, so that bubbles up. There's a whole commercial interest, and as people, and Google is starting to prioritize free, timing, freshness of content. Same thing with books. Uh, we have a whole sort of, as we, as we talk about br books and, and bring together books, we've also interlinked it with the ease of adding it to your calendar, subscribing to uh, events, subscribing to um, sharing it. I'm going to a yoga class. I'd like people around me to go to, to the same yoga class because, you know, getting into hard positions is tough and things like that. <laughs> we do the same thing with books. Uh, books are a li little bit more complicated. Uh, you know, you have to go through a, a process by taking mark, mark data or bib frame data and converting it into linked data. Um, uh, and uh, 
but it's a lot, it's really tough to compete in the book domain because Amazon with its SEO and SEM is, is really, really on the top. And it's, it's, it's a journey, it's a process to be able to do that and start competing. Start with events, start where, where, where you really have unique value proposition, extend that to books, extend that to sharing. With Discover Local, your books start showing up. And the beautiful thing is now, Google has now started adding these smart information catalogs that show up as, as, as if you have enriched data with the appropriate mark, with the appropriate link data formats, the, it starts to enrich. And you can see right over there, books will show up not only by pricing, but library books will show up at a zero cost. Again, enhancing, checking of availability becomes easier. Check, signing up for a library card becomes easier and correlating content that is of similar nature starts to bubble up. We spend a lot of time really thinking about the analytics. A lot of, a lot of products, um, you know, I don't want to get into my background, but a lot of products essentially lack fundamentally a deep level of analytics that would be germane in, in other industries. We are focused really because we want the libraries to make, a, 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 and I, and, I, and I shy from saying business decision, but this is a business decision about what kind of content and what kind of uh, programs should you be facilitating. And you want to out create an outreach and create, get insights that will allow you to be able to do that. Oh. How Discover Local works? Really simple. Upload, optimize, we geotag everything, search, results, reserve, learn. Thank you. There we go. Next, we have James from Bloomsbury Digital Resources. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is James Lingle, and I am the Associate Director of Sales for Bloomsbury Digital Resources. On the screen, you will see our mission statement for our digital division. Uh, we've been a digital publisher for about five years. Um, in that time, we've got the Berg Fashion Library, Drama Online, the Churchill Archive, and our ebook platform. But it was only last year that uh, we decided we were going to actually launch a digital division outright. So we've had a vast amount going on. The mission statement didn't exist and uh, has only really just been created. A lot can happen in that time. We've expanded, oops, I'm hitting the wrong one, sorry. We've expanded our offerings, created a new interface, a new logo, and obviously a lot of new products that go along with it. So now the fun starts. Taking that into consideration and wanting to avoid a boring presentation, I thought, how can I have fun with this situation? Welcome to Bloomsbury Digital Resources. This was given to me by the ladies in the office who wanted to say, thank you all for being here. It's 5 o'clock on a Thursday. There are many other places you could be. <laughs> so thank you for being here. You could be out having a wine or beer. You could be out having a martini or two as some librarians are prone to do. I actually think this is fabulous. I wish they made this product. I haven't been able to find it, but uh, I know a lot of li librarians who would partake. So this is our headquarters in Bloomsbury, London. Uh, 30 years, that's how long Bloomsbury has been around. We got famous 20 years ago, almost magically, you could say, when a scar on a forehead, it was found. If you didn't know, Bloomsbury is the original pub publisher of Harry Potter. We've been rather busy bees in that time, just so you know, and you're wondering where I'm going with this. <laughs> just a couple of weeks ago, we won the Booker Prize with Lincoln in the Bardo. Um, we're rather very proud of that, so we have a yay us moment. <laughs> Back to our logo slide. So the reason I'm actually here, I should get around to that. Bloomsbury Digital Resources is really where it's at. If I still want my job, then I'd better start the show. Um, I wanted to talk about kittens and rainbows, just to let you know. Um, so as a division, we're turning one year old. We literally just came to be. Um, in that time, we've published a lot of products. We have the Arcadian Library, Berg Fashion Library, Bloomsbury Collections, Fashion Photography, Drama Online, Churchill Archive, Popular Music, Design Library, Whitaker's, Cultural History, Encyclopedia of Philosophers, Food Library, only one more, Education and Childhood Studies, Architecture, Screen Studies, and Fashion Business Cases are all forthcoming products. Now back to it. So, thinking about it, you could almost say we're the new kids on the block. This is one of our books. 
And just an FYI, they're in Bloomsbury Popular Music. Well, isn't that a shock? With all the products you've just seen, I had to make a choice. In a town known for its culinary, uh, culinary delights, my stomach had a voice. So the Bloomsbury Food Library it is. Let's take a walk on a timeline, exploring history and anthropology, explore how General So's chicken came to be. Have I got it? Yep. Major reference, monographs, primary content, you can learn about sustainability, world map, food science, culinary arts, all provided with great taxonomy. So, I had to put this picture in because obviously of where we are, shrimp and grits, had to be done. Students and scholars can come to learn about, learn, learn about food in all its manifestations, DOIs, marks, DRM free, we plan to exceed your expectations. Our goal is very easy, and it's to give you more than you expect. Farm to table, we cannot do, but publisher to institution, we give you complete respect. <laughs> Top authors in the field, global coverage, there is so much more to say, but when you've only got five minutes, time tends to slip away. So once again, thank you all for joining me on a brief visit to see the wonderful digital resources we're creating at Bloomsbury. So next we have Travis from Code Ocean. Good evening. Uh, my name is Travis Hughley. I'm the director of institutional partnerships for Code Ocean. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Code Ocean uh, stems from a Cornell Tech incubated startup. And the founder, Simon Adar, was actually a spectral imaging engineer. And in the field, Simon ran into two major issues. Um, uh, as he was doing his research. One of those was actually finding the code behind the data, and the other was actually running the code once he had it. And I think this is a really good segue to talk about what some researchers are out there and, and, and the, the challenges that they're facing now. And it's more often than not these days that research is backed up behind software code, uh, statistical analysis, algorithms, and there's currently not a way to curate them in our system. Uh, but these components are essential to reproducing the research and also building upon further research. So we're, we're essentially talking here about the scholarly record, and I've heard some sessions today that talk about this, and you know, how do we view code and data together? You know, where does it live? How is it accessed? So at uh, Code Ocean, we're essentially a cloud-based re computational reproducibility uh, platform. We allow researchers to discover, share, and run code so they can run the code, they can test for reproducible results, and they can actually execute the code with new input values. Okay? For those of you who don't know uh, the steps it takes uh, to get a piece of code up and running, this, these are the steps it took before Code Ocean. So starting with step number one, uh, and many say this is the easiest step. So as a researcher, uh, you have to contact the PI and say, I saw some research, I like your code, and this could still take days, weeks, and months to get. From that point, uh, the researcher would have to acquire the right hardware, set up the environment, import the right files, and at this point, many researchers dub this phase dependency hell, because one file is dependent on another file is dependent on another file. And if you've ever been there, it can get really deep, uh, really long, very quickly. Okay? Uh, from that point, the researcher uh, has installed everything. They've got to look for errors in the code. They've got to debug the code. Finally, they're at a point where they can actually run the results and see the results. That's for one piece of code. Okay, so what we've done with Code Ocean, we've essentially eliminated the first six steps. So all you have to do is press run. Okay, so for researchers, obviously we've talked about the ability to run the code, uh, reproducible results, executing the code. Uh, for librarians and archivists, uh, access to scientific code with the data, um, and it's structured in a way with the metadata. Okay, so it's all there. For administration, deans and provost, uh, there's peace of mind knowing that uh, computational research is reproducible. So, how does it work? So, if you were to go on your phone, on your laptop, um, you can easily search for research, DOI, author. When you get to the point where you actually want to play with some code, we have 11 different languages to offer. So, if you give me something to run in Python, I don't have to have a Python license. 
Okay, if you give me something to run a MATLAB, I can run your code, and I don't need a license for that. Okay, so this is very unique. Uh, once you're in the, the, you know, the coding environment, we call this a compute capsule. So what we've done, we've configured, configured the compute capsule where we've separated the code files from the data files. And in the center is a, a sandbox where you can essentially go in there and write the code yourself. To the right are the results. You click run and you see the results. You can share this with a colleague. Uh, you can go on. It's open access. Anything that's published right now, you can go on and, and mess around with. You can change the input values. So if you see someone's research and you say, I wonder what would happen if I put this here, you can do that and run the code. Uh, I'll end with uh, uh, some research, uh, Springer Nature. This was out uh, last year. What strikes me about the graph on the, on the right is that I think we can all understand why and how researchers are having difficulty running uh, experiments from other researchers. But what's striking about this is researchers are having difficult, difficulty reproducing their own research. And so that's why we're here. Uh, we're here to make an impact. And uh, if you missed our session, we had a session earlier with our partnership, our penny partnership with Harvard's Dataverse. Uh, please come find me afterwards, and I would love to tell you more about it. Thank you. So next we have Tony from EBSCO. Thank you, Trey. My name is Tony Zanders with EBSCO. And I'd like to talk to you about a community we are a part of called FOLIO, which is an acronym for the future of libraries is open. And FOLIO is an open source library services platform being developed by libraries, vendors, individual contributors around the world. And that platform is free, it's open source, can be downloaded by anyone from github.com. And the applications that are built on top of that platform will provide a variety of functions across the library's use cases. Today I'd like to talk to you about the Folio Codex, which is the way Folio will treat metadata that's being used by all of those different types of applications. And the easiest way to understand the Folio Codex is to refer to it as cataloging by reference or referential cataloging as opposed to copy cataloging. So why is this important? And so ironically and uh, serendipitously, Michelle was here to give you a primer on BibFrame. And so I'm going to do a next chapter to his five minute talk and present to you an interpretation of BibFrame and hopefully you're starting to realize that we're moving past theory and we're moving into practice. And so Codex is Folio's data abstraction, which is based on BibFrame's principles, work, instance, and holding. It's offering a unified repository for a view of the complete collection despite resource type, whether the source record is cataloged in MARC or MODS or Dublin Core or even BibFrame. It's leveraging referential cataloging concepts, and so the original source record can exist outside of Folio. It can come from a variety of different consortial catalogs or national bibliographic catalogs, and multiple can coexist inside of your Folio instance. And this is the foundation for extensible applications that you can build on top of Folio and extend them to a variety of use cases. So the traditional view for libraries who manage e-resources and print primarily, is that the knowledge base contained all your data for your e-resources and MARC in the ILS. We know that different types of metadata are relevant for each type of resource, but at the same time, there's some things that those resources have in common. There are also apps that you rely on to manage those resources separately, creating duplication and effort and redundancy in data. Folio is trying to rethink this to understand what do we need to leverage that as a common denominator and what's separate about these resources that we can share with an app at the just-in-time moment. And so I want to give you two examples of what this will look like inside of an app. Take, for instance, an app that allowed you to check out a book and check in a book. All of the data inside of the MARC record doesn't need to be inside of that app. The only data that needs to come from the mark record is the title. And the title will allow the operator to determine if this is the correct book that's being checked out. 
And so instead of copying that entire MARC record over to your Folio instance, it's just referencing that record out wherever it lives, and that app is only taking the piece of metadata it needs to perform its function as an app. All right? Another example is, say, for instance, your library is using an app to evaluate usage data on a thesis, how often a thesis is used. For that app, the only information that's needed is that usage data. You don't have to know, for that app to add value, who the author of the thesis is. You don't have to know who the reviewer of the thesis is. Just the metadata that is relevant for that thesis will be inside of that app. So these apps are very lightweight, easy to produce, and Folio Codex is the foundation for how metadata will be managed across these apps. And so in closing, I want to show you a diagram of the codex that shows Folio can manage a variety of sources inside of one Folio instance. Again, whether you're a member of a consortium, you want to leverage metadata from Library of Congress, a variety of sources. But at the same time, the, no matter what type of resource you're managing, Folio can handle the electronic, the digital, and even types of resources that come into the future that we haven't thought of yet. If you want to learn more, you can go to folio.org. As an open source community, everything is open to the public. There are videos and demos of the codex on YouTube. And so if you just Google Folio Codex, you can have a lot of fun. Thanks again, and hope to talk to you afterwards. Next, we have Barbara from ProQuest. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Barbara Olson, and I do product marketing for ProQuest with our historical collections. And today, I'm going to be discussing with you a new feature that we are going to be uh, rolling out into one of our primary source products called Early European Books. So first of all, let me tell you a little bit about the early modern period and, and why we care. Um, uh, some background on early European books, which we're, we call EEB. So EEB is a new product that's designed to support the needs of scholars of Europe in the early modern period. EEB was informed by the, by the experiences of its predecessor and our flagship product, some of you may know it, called Early English Books, and we also call that EBO. EBO took 70 years for us to build, and it covers all the works published in English language countries in the early modern period. But it also involved a collaboration of over 200 libraries. slide. Here we go. For early European books, we partnered with five national libraries in Europe and digitized their curated modern, early modern collections to achieve a solid foundation of content, which is very similar to EBO. The geographic locations of these five libraries is really important. Libraries in Denmark, the Netherlands, and the Wellcome Library in London give EBE a steady foothold in Northern Europe. Libraries in France and Italy provide that same foothold in Southern Europe. As a result, in just eight years, we were able to, to build EBE, and it's the same size as EBO, and both collections have over 17 million page images. Why do we care about the early modern period? Well, this particular period, which is defined as the time between 1450 and 1700, encompasses some of the most transformation, dramatic transformations in society and hotly contested events in history. The period is very important to scholars, not only in history and literature, but also in early science and art, architecture and geography. And it's the foundation of modern contemporary thought. The most significant fact is that this period saw the rise of the printing press, which was instrumental in spreading new ideas, such as the debates over the Reformation. It also was, and also to see, we also, excuse me, which saw not only more intellectuals reading Latin, but also translations of these works into vernacular languages, making these works much more accessible to wider so so social groups. I forgot to change that slide. What do we know about researchers of this period? From the user study studies that we've conducted, researchers of this period tend to browse through books like they would a physical book. So they care about marginalia, they care about bindings, and they actually even care about multiple copies of the same book. Early European books challenges the traditional ways of researching this period. But how? 
By standardizing and enriching metadata and by enlisting the help of early modernist historians and catalogers at St. Andrews University in Scotland, which is also known as the USTC, we took these five source libraries' data, and all of it was very different, and we standardized it across all of the collections in early European books. By standardizing this data, especially the place of publication, we were able to place the works on a historically accurate map of Europe. The feature that we have developed is called the Early European Book Scatter Map. Here on this, on this particular slide are, there are pinpoints on a map. And in this case, what you're looking at are the representation of the works that are curated by the BNF in Paris, which is the National Library of France. On this particular slide, you're looking at all of the works curated by the Wellcome Library in London. And you'll notice how this library has a much wider reach of works collected from across all of Europe, including Spain. Here's an example of the scatter map filtered on language, which is particularly important for linguistic scholars who can access these materials using their own particular language specialty. Here in this filter, we see the USTC subject themes added to each work in early European books. And there are 38 subject themes in total. Some examples, because that slide's very hard to read, um, art and architecture, Bibles, drama, medical text, poetry, and many more. These new terms are a standard, standardized version of the USTC classification scheme and provide an additional discovery layer for scholars in English language across foreign language material. This filter shows what cities and countries were busy publishing material on different on specific topics. It shows the landscape of early modernist preoccupations and the trends of time. Clicking on a particular pinpoint gives you access to a thumbnail image of the work. So in conclusion, the early European book scatter map allows a scholar to visualize early modern works as data points on a map of Europe helping to increase our understanding of the landscape and trends from this important period. The scatter map below is an entry point to this huge sample of works to discover and explore in new ways. Thank you for your attention. So next we have Michael from Springer Nature. Thanks. I'm excited to introduce about this. There we go. I'm excited to introduce a new research solution from Springer Nature that not only provides libraries with the largest database of protocols and methods in the life sciences, but also delivers game-changing new search functionality and assessment features to help researchers find, evaluate, and implement protocols. And pardon my spelling of recipe, I hope nobody judges me. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, to quickly review what a protocol is, uh, in biological, medical, and pharmaceutical research, it is important to document the course of experiments precisely so they can be replicated by researchers in other labs. You can think of protocols as recipes that, when followed accurately in experiments, have the potential to create advancements that improve the way people live. With the formation of Springer Nature in 2015, we created the largest resource, resource of protocols and methods for life sciences, bringing together four resources that most of you are familiar with, Springer Protocols, Nature Protocols, Nature Methods, and Protocol Exchange. Our goal with Springer Nature experiments is to deliver an all-encompassing solution that is truly able to connect users to the most relevant and important protocols to their research. We've accomplished this by developing new search functionality that we based on deep analysis of what researchers are actually searching for. And that's scientific techniques they want to apply in the lab and the organisms that they want to use. Using what we call intelligent article indexing, which is done with machine learning and text mining, we can extract techniques and organisms from within articles and provide that information in a variety of ways. Now let's take a look at the search page with a search for a trending technique CRISPR and mice. You can see we've gone from 55,000 articles to 271 articles. On the left, you have more ways to narrow search results. And let me mention here that we now have over 680 videos and provide a filter to search specifically for videos. 
And exclusive to this product, as I mentioned earlier, is search by technique. We have over 2,000 techniques to filter by. On the right, the search page also provides a lot of information about the article to help the researcher quickly assess relevancy. There are many ways to sort results, including relevant citations and trending. Terms the user was searching for are highlighted, so the user can quickly look at the abstract and determine where search words are located for context. A list of techniques and organisms mentioned in the article is also listed for further review, and citations are noted and clickable. You can also directly email the authors of the article from this page. Now, once an article is clicked, you are brought to its unique landing page. And um, this really makes it easy to compare different protocols. On this page, you have more info to further determine relevancy. We provide additional author and affiliation info, access to full text, keywords for further assessment, the abstract, and here the user can scroll through all of the figures and videos for the protocol to get more insight. In addition, the user can quickly view the history of the protocol and easily find previous or more current versions. And take a look at how Springer Nature Experiments stacks up against similar products. We offer the most content, optimized search, tons of additional info to easily access rel assess relevancy, and our exclusive search by techniques and organisms. Now, I'm going to get to the best part. Um, while you do need a license to access the full text of this product, uh, the product is free to use for everyone without a subscription. Um, this is really part of Springer Nature's uh, commitment to advancing discovery. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right. We actually have some time for questions, but before we get to that, uh, you may want to pull out your phones and you're going to get ready to vote. You're not actually going to vote on anything yet. You're just going to get ready to vote. So this is how it works. So the number 2233 is the phone number you will be texting. You will then text, in the body of your text, you will type C-H-S-C-O-N-F, doesn't matter about capitalization, and this allows you to join the poll. So you guys work on that, and whoever has a question, well, now I've probably I've set you to a task, and then I've asked you to come ask questions, so maybe you need a minute. I think, I think all of our presentations are really great. We had a wonderful diversity uh, of submissions this year, and I, I think we should give everyone another round of applause. So anybody with a question, please come to the mic in the middle of the room. I see we have someone coming. So please make sure you identify who your question is for first. Um, hi, I'm Christine Dunleavy. I'm from the University of South Florida in St. Petersburg. My question is for anyone who spoke about BibFrame. Is there anything um, non-proprietary -propri open source? Are you um, working on proprietary um, discovery layers, which is what I think is what you're doing. Am I right? <laughs> this is certainly a very good question, and uh, there will be different uh, uh, level of uh, services uh, um, um, available and uh, certainly some of them will be openly available and um, there will be also at the same time, especially for um, higher level of reconciliation aspects, I mean there will be then also um, um, components that will be um, under subscription for example or following certain um, economic models. Thank you, Michelle. And I must say that at Cult is the name of an Italian firm who works very closely with Casolini. They're a member of the Folio community um, representing Italy. Um, Folio is an open source platform, uh, therefore it's free. It's licensed under an Apache version two open source software license, which is the most permissive of open source licenses. That means you can download, 
remix, re-engineer, um, even um, have commercial gain on top of the platform, and that's from that Apache version 2 license. And so the codex, which is the way metadata is being managed on t inside of Folio, is a part of that open source offering as, as well. Hopefully that answers the question. More questions? Don't be shy. Okay. <laughs> Looks like everyone's really excited about voting. I think that's what this is. <laughs> All right, well, if we have questions later, we can come back. I think we have time for that later. So, the first, so this is the test. This is to make sure you understand how this works. So, what is your favorite iconic Charleston dish? Text A for shrimp and grits, B for fried tomatoes, fried green tomatoes, and C for she crab soup. And we'll give it about 15, 30, 20, 20 to 30 seconds here. I mean, shrimp and grits is taking the lead. I have to agree. I, these are all three my fa favorites, so it's hard for me to pick. Okay, people are still voting. That's, as long as the chart's moving, people are voting, so. I, it, it's obviously shrimp and grits. So let's give Shrimp and Grits a round of applause, all right? <laughs> okay, so now for the first real question. I actually forgot I put that in there, so that was a bit of a surprise for me too. So the best design, the best designed product or service tonight, Lean Library, Castellini, Dimco, Bloomsbury, Code Ocean, EBSCO, ProQuest, and Springer Nature. I hope everyone's voting. This is your chance to put your voice out there. Okay. Give it a couple more seconds. Looks pretty close. All right, I believe Code Ocean, well, yep, Code Ocean it seems to have taken best design this year. Come on up here, come on. All right. With the Lean Library a close second. Yeah. All right, which product or service had the highest impact this year? Highest impact on your, your the services you're able to provide to directly to your patrons, whatever it is. getting kind of close there. The silence is killing me, but I, I can't just babble on, can I? <laughs> All right, it looks like Lean Library has the highest impact with Dimco and Code Ocean tied for second. And our final category tonight, most innovative, which is really what this is all about. Who had the most innovative product? I think I'm just gonna call it. <laughs> All right, let's hear it for Code Ocean again. Wow. Did you sweep? I think we had a, uh, did we sweep that? You took all three? No, did I miss? Okay, all right, that's two out of three is not bad. All right. Well, congratulations to all of you. You all are excellent products. That's why you're here tonight. Uh, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. Come next year. All right.